Okay. Great. Good evening. Welcome to February 16th, 2023 meeting of the Cohasset Conservation Committee. I'm Chris McFarland, Chairman of the Conservation Committee. We'll be running tonight's meeting as we implement the Massachusetts Wetland Protection Act, Cohasset Stormwater Management, and Wetland Protection Bylaws. Uh, we'll be operating tonight's meeting using the Zoom platform and ask the public who wish to speak to enter your question, comment, or concern into the chat box. Please include your name and address. Only those that include name and address will be recognized. If necessary, you can also raise your hand and Charlotte will try to elevate you to be able to speak. Um, present this evening on behalf of the commission are the conservation administrator, Angela Giso, and the town conservation agent, Charlotte Patel. We'll now take a roll call of commissioners. Please respond by repeating your name and saying present. Will Ashton. Will Ashton, present. Tom Bell. Tom Bell, present. Kathy Berrigan. Kathy Berrigan, present. Eric Eisenhower. Eric Eisenhower, present. Chris McIntyre. Chris McIntyre, present. Chris McFarland present. Tonight we have a quorum of six commissioners. We'll be taking roll call vote <clears throat> with each commissioner answering yay, nay, or abstain. Um, our first hearing this evening is NOI 23-05 and stormwater permit 23-04 for 49 Border Street. This is a new hearing, so I need to read it into the public record. In accordance with Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 131, Section 40, the Cohasset Wetland Bylaw and the Cohasset Stormwater Bylaw, the Cohasset Conservation Commission will hold a public hearing on Thursday, February 16, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. via remote participation on Zoom platform for Notice of Intent 23-05 and Stormwater Permit 23-04 to raise a two-family house and rebuild a single-family house for applicants Peter and Carly we're risky at 49 Border Street. All right, uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, Jeff Hassett here, civil engineering with Morris Engineering. Here on behalf of uh, Peter and Carly Horisky, and also on the call is Sean Papish, the landscape architect for this project. So this property, it's 49 Border Street. Uh, the property is located on the opposite side of Border Street from the Atlantic parking lot, so on, on the uphill side. And the property is developed with a two family home currently that was built in 1895 and a paved driveway. Uh, the property slopes from Border Street up towards the rear of the property and the area behind the home is a very steep ledge, really not a buildable area. Uh, the property is small, it's about 3,500 square feet in size. Currently there's no stormwater mitigation on the property and the runoff flows towards Border Street where there are catch basins in the road. Um, and I will share my screen. Oh. Go ahead, Jeff. All right, thanks. Okay, so the uh, Cohasset Harbor is located here. The Atlantica would be right off the page here. And this is the parking lot for the Atlantica. Border Street heading towards the bridge going this way. And this is the 3,500 square foot property currently developed with a single family home and a paved driveway. Uh, the resource areas include the top of Coastal Bank, which is defined by the seawall or retaining wall on the opposite side of the road. Uh, the 50 foot buffer is shown in red and the 100 foot buffer is in green. The other resource area is the property is mapped as, a, as being in the FEMA floodplain. So this area, down gradient of the orange line is land subject to coastal storm flowage. So the proposed work will be to demolish that existing home, construct a new one family home in the same general location. Um, it's a modest size home. It's about 2,700 square feet of living area. And the work in the buffer zones includes about 1,800 square feet in the front part of the property, which is previously developed. Um, but again, in that land subject to coastal storm flowage due, due to the FEMA line. And then we're also proposing about 27 square feet in the 50 foot buffer right here. Um, that work is replacing some concrete steps and putting in a stone trench at, um, down along the frontage along the roadway to get to pick up stormwater runoff coming off the site. So this project, um, the existing home is not FEMA compliant. It's built uh, on a full foundation and not high enough in elevation. 
Um, this project will eliminate that nonconformity. The new house will be will be elevated, constructed on concrete piers above that base flood elevation, which is required per per building code. Um, we're also significantly decreasing the the impervious. Currently, what you have on the site for impervious is ledge at the back, the existing house footprint, and the paved driveway. Um, the house will be removed. The paved driveway will be removed. Um, the new house is going to be elevated onto um, onto the piers. It's going to be pervious surfaces below. So it's going to be crushed stone for the majority. And then there's an area for one car to park underneath and then an area um, in the front of the house where it'll be pervious pavers. We detail that on the plan. Um, we're also specifying a crushed stone trench along the perimeter of the house to pick up the roof runoff. And a, uh, we're doing porous asphalt for a driveway. And also a, um, the walkway will be um, stepping stones and native stone mulch. So we're essentially eliminating just about all of that non-natural impervious. Um, and then as far as, so we did submit the structural plan showing the, um, the foot, the piers, the concrete piers, and we also submitted a landscaping plan. Um, we're not proposing to remove any trees on this property. Um, we are proposing a significant number of plantings. Um, Sean has specified five red cedars, as well as 31 bushes and 109 perennials and grasses. So quite a bit. Uh, Quite a bit more plantings. So to summarize, um, other than that one small area I mentioned, all the work is out of the 50-foot buffer. Uh, we're looking at less uh, impervious, bringing a structure into FEMA compliance, and more plantings. And the other permit that this project needed was zoning board, which we did receive um, earlier in the month. Uh, with that, Sean, do you have anything to add? Yep, I think you covered it all. Uh, essentially, what we're doing is Getting our native plant list, everything that should function really well there. Um, you see the list there, and, and Jeff had mentioned those. Um, so we're essentially taking out anything that is that is lawn right in that area, and replacing with planting. So I, it's a tough little spot, and uh, right across from the water and across from a parking lot and everything else. So I do think, given that it's essentially across from a sea of asphalt and still using native plants in uh, in the areas, both in the uh, that little tiny piece of the of the 50 and all the way through the 100 and beyond, I'm pretty excited about the beyond. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff, could I ask you to go back to your site plan, please? Commissioners, do you have any questions off off hand? Eric, you're muted. Yeah, Chris, um, could you have them increase the size of that? I can. I can't read anything. Jeff, mm -hmm. can you blow it up a little, please? Yeah. Maybe do a hundred instead of seventy-five, and and put it in the center. Thank you. There you go. So, Jeff, Jeff, is the crushed stone area by the driveway? Is that for parking on? Is that the idea? <laughs> No, it's only about three feet wide, so it's not wide enough to park a vehicle. Um, so is it kind of some additional stormwater mitigation down on that flat area at the bottom? Okay. And uh, what, what's the what's the slope on the driveway? Um, so it's coming up from ten to twelve over. Twenty-eight feet. Ten divided by twenty-eight. Um, oops, sorry, two divided by 28. It's about a 7%. It won't be as steep as the current driveway. Okay. Now, I, I, I've read a number of articles kind of questioning how, how well forest asphalt functions at that slope. What's your, what's your take on that? Um, my, my take on it is that, you know, currently it's a relatively steep site and all the water flows right off into Border Street and is picked up in the catch basins without any issue. Um, we didn't have any room on the site for, you know, traditional, because it's just such a small site, we couldn't put dry wells in, we couldn't do a rain garden. So we took the approach of, you know, wherever we could, let's do a, a pervious surface. Okay. I do think we're at five, about 5% 5 there actually. 
I do think we're a little closer to 5%, Jeff. Okay, that's good. much better, yeah. That's kind of the number where we think of is, I, I, in my opinion, and I'm, you know, Jeff would certainly be able to give me his thoughts on that. I think we're right at that limit at 5% for previous paving is still probably pretty acceptable. Chris, as far as, okay. I'm not sure what you've seen in some of the stuff that you're doing, but it feels like something like 5% is kind of about our maximum. Okay, and and I I, under, I understand that the um, there's a there's a maintenance and operation manual that's been submitted with this. Is that correct, Charlotte? And and that that suggests that the uh, the applicant will be maintaining the porous asphalt. Yep. Yeah, okay. it did say um, Jeff. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it said vacuuming monthly, jet washing, and then no sanding, uh, and salting only to like the minimum extent. I think. Yeah, the, the main thing is with it is you don't want to put sand and salt on it if you don't have to. Um, right. I mean, they use these in parking lots, commercial parking lots all the time where you see a lot of sand and salt. Yeah. You just don't get, you don't, there's really no need to sand and salt a, a driveway right on the harbor that often. Um, and then we also talk about in the O&M is maintain the mulch beds, make sure the mulch isn't going to flow onto the driveway. Um, but, but yeah, ma maintenance is crucial with these. And, um, but this is a detail of the construction. You have several layers of stone beneath the uh, porous asphalt. Okay. Jeff, Eric Eisenhower, um, I'm sure you've considered alternatives to your uh, new construction in the resource area. Could you review what alternatives are possible within the 50 foot? On the within right the 50, side? well, the only work within the 50 foot is that stone trench and reconfiguring the steps. I mean, we could keep the existing steps, which are, you can see in gray just behind, um, if that was an issue with the, con the commission, and we could limit the stone to, uh, to end the stone right before the 50 foot buffer. I, I just don't see the net benefit of that though. It's currently lawn too. It's lawn in that area, isn't it, Jeff? That's- It, it is, yes. It's, it, right, it's right on the shoulder of the road. Yeah. And across from a parking lot and a seawall yeah. from practical application. Jeff, did you say that was about 27 square feet? And that's that correct. Okay. So it's not that. So back to that um, strip along the street, is that in the right of way? It is, yes. Yeah. Okay. And, and there is a storm drain nearby, is that? Yeah, the nearest one is right here. And you mentioned that um, there's, that the current runoff uh, seems to make it to the storm drain without flooding the street. Is that, um, how do you know that? I guess is the question. Yeah, as far as I'm aware, um, there aren't any known drainage issues in this area. We've been working on this, project for I mean, over a year now and I, I haven't noticed anything. There, there's a discrepancy between the um, the area of the lot uh, and the assessor's map. Uh, were you aware of that? Yeah, the primary reason for that is they have reconfigured Border Street, I think three or four, at least three times, maybe four times. Make it, and not always making it wider, sometimes making it narrower and reconfiguring it. So they made our surveyor, I don't know, think about it a little bit, but that's where we landed, 3,555 square feet. Yeah. But the, but the, the reconfiguring border street shouldn't affect the lot size, right? Oh, it, it, it certainly does. Um, you know, where where is the front property line? If it moves over here or over here, Right, but Border Street hasn't moved that far, has it? It's changed pretty significantly, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's a thousand foot difference. Yeah. Out of curiosity, what do they have it as? More land area? Or less? Um, yeah, I think, yeah, hang on a second. It's uh, 4791. Yeah. 0.11 acres is what, what's on the uh, assessor's records. So I just wondered, what, what, that's, that's a pretty big discrepancy and wondered what the the source of that was. Um, yeah. I, I also see that the um, 
the elevations here in the back of the lot are wildly inconsistent with the digital elevation model. Um, and I wonder whether, uh, how that happened. Do you guys survey this and do these contours yourself or what? Yes, we, we did. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it, if, if the assessor's map is correct here on um, mass mapper, which it probably isn't, uh, but still there's a huge difference there. Uh, I believe there's a 50 foot difference, actually, that should be 90 feet at the back of the lot. Let me, let me be sure of that, but. No, that, that, that cannot be correct. Um, because we, we surveyed this, 30, 40, we surveyed it with, um, 50. on the yeah, ground. Correct. That, that, that's right. It's a, it's, it's, it's a, I can see that it, that 40 feet works there. Okay. Yeah. So, where the where when when you put in your downspouts, where are they going to go? Are they going to be fed into that trench, or and you're and you're expecting some infiltration underneath the house? Is that is that uh, correct? That's correct. No. Yeah. I noticed your numbers are very close to uh, the existing, so you don't have much slack there. No, I'm also I I mean I. I think they're conservative numbers too. I could have, could have taken more. Yeah. I'm not taking credit for infiltration in the. So, what sort of a curve number do you use for five percent slope um, permeable pavement? Similar to what lawn is. What's that? Similar to lawn. And that would be in the '80s, right? Um, give me a second. I need to open that up. Yeah, I think it's '80, but please correct me if I'm wrong. Really, is that something? Is that a number that comes from the manufacturer, Jeff, or is uh, where did this number come from? What's the origin? First, let me just confirm what number we used. Yeah. Yeah, we use an, uh, number eighty, which um, you know, impervious would be ninety-eight. Right. Eighty is similar to what grass or land, um, landscape cover would be. That's what I typically use. And, and again, um, so how did you select that number? Is that is that a specification that comes with the manufacturer of the material, or is there some um, tech sheet or specification sheet that the state publishes about this? How did, how did you arrive at? at I, I'm not aware of any guide guidelines that give you a definitive answer on what to use. It also, you know, depends on what it, are the underlying soil types, whether it's um, you have D soils or a, or A soils. So this is, so this number is a D soil lawn in what, comparison. Want to show us the cross section of your driveway again? Yeah. Thanks. So the, one of the reasons that my calculations are conservative is sometimes you'll see engineers take credit for actual storage in this stone reservoir below. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm not doing that. Okay. And I'm also not taking credit for the other uh, stone trenches for infiltration. Okay. Or for that matter, the gravel under the house or the pervious pavers. So you're coming up with a cross section, right? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I could see it on my, my end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There you are. <laughs> okay. Single corner. So uh, I would assume that that pea gravel then is pretty well sized. It's, it's all a fairly uniform size. So that's going to be pretty uh, permeable. Crushed stone as well, and three quarter crushed stone. So again, you got something fairly permeable, I suppose. I just wonder about the uh, bank run gravel here, I guess. 
um, that's going to be somewhat less permeable. Yeah, that, that's recommended by DEP, though. For porous, porous asphalt? Yeah. Yeah, yeah the, this, this cross-section comes from the, the stormwater handbook. Okay, so, so if you were to uh, evaluate this, uh, what, what, what is the least porous, not porous, but permeable layer in this sandwich here? The most permeable, permeable, well, three quarter inch crushed stone. The, the least, the least. The least, probably that bank run gravel, yeah. So the porous asphalt is, is not the, something something's the, is the limiting um, layer here to infiltration. And you don't think it's the top, top coat here is a, a porous asphalt paving? No, no. Do you have any numbers for the uh, for the permeability? Not the uh, you know pervious and impervious are, are binary statements, right? Um, do you have any do you have any values for the permeability of that porous asphalt paving pavement? Um, well, th this porous asphalt has been approved by this commission on a number of projects, including oh, I, I know it parking has. lots. I, I know. Um, and I think on other projects we've talked about. There are a number of, if, you know, if you Google porous asphalt, there's a number of videos online where they show a hose spraying on a parking lot and the water right. is all going right through, not running off, even right. a fire hose. Um, one of the one of the facilities where they did that is uh, UNH has has a big parking lot um, with porous asphalt, and there's, there's a few videos of that. Mm -hmm. So the, the stuff does work; it absolutely does work. Mm -hmm. It just seems like they're really going to get out there with a vacuum cleaner every 30 days and power and vacuum it, and then they have to power wash it. Charlotte, is that the next step in maintaining this? Yeah, I think it says um, vacuuming monthly and then jet washing or power washing. I think Jeff, that's what's in the long-term O&M plan that you put. That's right, and I, I think the power washing is more applicable for a small driveway like this. Yeah more of a commercial site, you'd be using the vacuum. Isn't the idea of using the vacuum to remove stuff that would um, be driven into the porous asphalt by a power washer? Yeah, we, we are we are specifying to do both. Yeah. I, I but I'm saying like the poor, you wouldn't be out there with uh, blasting a, a parking lot, you would just suck it out more, more regularly. Right, right. Why why monthly? I mean, haven't we, the ones we've approved, it seems like it was annual or maybe quarterly. I just wonder why this um, really dense schedule of, of maintenance. It's, it's because that's what the DEP stormwater handbook recommends. Do I really think this driveway needs it monthly? No, I think that's more applicable to a, a parking lot that's being sanded and salted, but it is what DEP as a blanket, what DEP recommends. Hmm. Thanks. It is, it is pretty close to the harbor. I think it'll be getting sanded quite often. <laughs> Salted? No, sand, no coming, up, coming from the beaches nearby. No. <laughs> there's a lot yeah, of it. Insulted. You get a lot of sand blown around, but Okay. Any other comments by commissioners? Charlotte, could you explain where the, the your attitude toward the lack of variance analysis for work in the 50? Uh, sorry, sorry, what was that, Eric? Yeah, I, I'm looking for the variance analysis for um, extenuating and unforeseen and unusual reasons mm -hmm. for work in the 50 foot buffer zone. Mm -hmm. And I don't see it here. And I assume, um, you, I assume you noted that. In your initial review, no. I admit I actually missed the sliver in the fifty-foot oh. buffer, but uh, we do need a variance for the um, uh, alteration of uh, greater than a thousand feet of a resource area, um, and I did note that for uh, for Jeff to include his, in um, his variance request. But I apologize, I, I for some reason missed the fifty-foot buffer sliver. <laughs> uh, but yes, we do need two variances in this case um, for the work in the fifty-foot buffer has to meet the rare and unusual circumstance criteria and then greater than a thousand square foot alteration of a resource area. Um, and 
you know, noting that it's pre-developed, you know, already pre previously disturbed, but that still is a variance we need to give. Jeff, could you please address the issue of rare and unusual circumstances and extenuating circumstances and in, in the work you want to do? I know it's I know it's not a large area, all right, but we still these are the rules and regulations here. So, could you explain how you see that playing out? Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it is a very rare property in that it's very small. It's completely developed. It's been developed since 1895. We're improving the conditions by removing a full foundation and replacing it with just the concrete piers and elevating the house, um, decreasing the impervious surfaces, um, restabilizing the entire site. I don't think you're addressing my question. But Oh yeah, can I Can you address the issue of rare and unusual vis-a-vis -vis the work in the 50, Jeff, please? Oh, for the work in the 50? Yeah. So what's unusual about it is that it's currently developed in that area with the, um, the steps. There's steps that are proposed to be replaced. So that that those steps are, um, you know, it's not a new structure. It's just replacing ones that need maintenance, and then adding the crushed stone trench. It's the crushed stone trench is only going to improve the conditions, and it's in an area that's immediately adjacent to the edge of pavement of a of a roadway. So it's um it's not pristine in any way. It's only 27 feet, I guess, square feet, is it? Or yards, feet? Square feet. I would have thought, because we, we come back to this every time we do work in the 50, Jeff, that you have had a better answer than that one as to why this is rare and unusual. Um, it's not a lot, though. I'm, I'm not sure if it's if it's worth haggling over, all right? But um, uh, And those are the rules that we have to live by. And we, we very often in the past uh, requested people to make change to plans small change in plans to avoid this type of incursion into the 50 foot area with you know new construction and all that but um chris what do you think well my my feeling on this is that this this piece of buffer is not buffering anything it's on the uh the, the road has a crown to it the water's actually pitching back away from the resource area um, so I, I don't i don't feel like we're really degrading a buffer which is contributing much to the uh to the resource area at this point. Okay. That would that would that would be my take on yeah. it. Jeff, what is native stone mulch? Um yeah. cobbles such as you would find um, locally. Three quarter inch, three quarter inch some in some cases you go with a smaller stone that's considered to be native stone. So why is it called mulch? I guess in to my mind, mulch is an organic um, filler here. It's referred to as mulch in, in the industries. Could be referred to as, as uh, stone layers or stone. Okay. You know, stone mulch is a pretty common thing to refer to it in the industry. Oh, so I've learned something tonight. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> like every time I show up, I learn something. Don't worry, Tom. I, you're, I, I'm in the same ball game. Inorganic mulch doesn't exist, but apparently we do now. Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. So now we need to ask whenever we see the word mulch, is it organic or is it inorganic? This complicates our life. <laughs> <laughs> well, we shouldn't open up our mouths, should we have? <laughs> well, maybe you shouldn't have put it on. Maybe you should have just said mixed stone okay. in there. <laughs> but yeah, no, I get it. It's, Okay. Okay. Well, I don't see any comments from the the audience, uh, the public. Um, if there's no further comments, um, I'd like to move ahead and and uh, suggest we take a vote on an order of conditions. But before we do, does anyone have any special conditions? No. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory in the long-term operation and maintenance plan to. Did, did we want to just issue a clarifying condition about just, you know, sticking to the long-term O&M plan with the porous pavement and all the other stormwater components? We don't normally do that, but for porous yeah. pavement, it's, you know, we don't see it that often, so. I think it's, well, it's 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 pretty straightforward that they yeah. have to comply, so. Exactly, yeah. Okay. 
All right, if there's no other comments, I'm going to move to close the public hearing and to issue an order of conditions um, with no, no special conditions, but our, our basic and our, our standard conditions. I have a second. Second. Having a motion and a second to issue an order of conditions for NOI 23-05. We'll take a roll call vote. Will Ashton. Will Ashton, aye. Tom Bell. Tom Bell, aye. Kathy Berrigan. Kathy Berrigan, aye. Eric Eisenhower. Eric Eisenhower, aye. Chris McIntyre. Chris McIntyre, aye. Chris McFarlane, aye. That vote passes 600. Zero. Um, I will also make a motion to issue a variance for work within the 50 foot buffer. Um, do I have a second? Second. Having a motion and second, we'll take a roll call vote. Will Ashton? Will Ashton, aye. Tom Bell? Tom Bell, aye. Kathy Berrigan? Kathy Berrigan, aye. Eric Eisenhower? Eric Eisenhower, aye. Chris McIntyre? Chris McIntyre, aye. Chris McFarlane, aye. That vote passes 6 0 0. And lastly, uh, uh, Mr. Make... Chair, sir, we also need a variance for the greater than thousand square foot alteration of the land subject to coastal storm flowage. Okay. Sorry, I didn't know if you I, wanted to you, combine them you, or do you them separately. Make that motion. <laughs> what was that? Can no, I do that? No, I don't think so. I don't think I can. Uh, I'll make a motion to issue um, a variance for work greater than one thousand feet within the area of coastal storm flowage. Do I have a second? Second. Having a motion and second, we'll take a roll call. Will Ashton? Will Ashton, aye. Tom Bell? Tom Bell, aye. Kathy Berrigan? Kathy Berrigan, aye. Eric Eisenhower? Eric Eisenhower, aye. Uh, Chris McIntyre? Chris McIntyre, aye. Chris McFarland, aye. That vote passes 600. And last, I'll make a motion to issue a stormwater permit 23 04 for 49 Border Street. Do I have a second? Second. Make a motion in a second. We'll take a roll call. Will Ashton. Will Ashton, aye. Tom Bell. Tom Bell, aye. Kathy Berrigan. <clears throat> Berrigan, aye. Eric Eisenhower. Eric Eisenhower, aye. Chris McIntyre. Chris McIntyre, aye. Chris McFarland, aye. That vote passes 6 0 0. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Appreciate it. Our second hearing this evening. Chris, is... oh, Chris, hold on one second. I have one question for Charlotte on the first one. Charlotte, is it really necessary? to request a, a variance for the 1,000 square foot storm flowage work when it's a pre-constructed lot that basically no one's breaking ground on, but it's, it's already um, in a finished state. Is it necessary to get a variance for that? Uh, good question. So uh, judging from the, based on the language in our regulations, we don't differentiate previously disturbed versus you know new development. Uh, if we wanted to clarify that, we definitely can, but yeah, the language right now just says greater than 1,000 square foot alteration of any resource area. Um, so yeah, we, we don't right now specify whether or not we care about previously disturbed or new development. So we'll take the easy way out. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. That's all right. Uh, second hearing this evening, NOI 23-04, uh, read it into the public record. Uh, in accordance with Massachusetts General Laws, chapter 131, section 40, the Classic Wetland Bylaw and the Classic Stormwater Bylaw, Classic Conservation Commission will hold a public hearing on Thursday, February 16th, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. via remote participation on a Zoom platform for Notice of Intent 23-04 to construct the pier, gangway, and float for applicant Lynn Baranowski at 50 Black Horse Lane. All right, thank you. Uh, Jeff Asset here again, and I see uh, Lynn is on the call as well, the uh, applicant and property owner. Great. All right, so we filed an NOI for a residential dock. Um, this property is 50, 50 and 55 Black Horse Lane. So if you're coming down Black Horse Lane in your car from Summer Street, the house is on the right-hand side, and they also own the, uh, the parcel on the opposite side of Black Horse Lane, which has about 150 feet of frontage on the Gulf. Uh, we had the wetlands delineated by Brad Holmes of Environmental Consulting and Restoration. And the, blue, the two blue lines are the seaward and landward limits of the saw marsh. Uh, upgradient of the saw marsh is, law, is lawn currently. So the residential dock, I'll zoom in on that. Oops. 
So the dock is made up of a four foot wide pier that's 148 feet long out to a section at the end that's six feet long um, for, for uh, the landing area. And from there, there's a uh, three foot wide by 24 foot long gangway, which is removable. And then a, um, I think it's 10 by 10 by 20 float, which is also removable. The float is equipped with, it'll be four piles underneath it with a board across it set, set so that the um, dock does not sit in the mud flats at low tide. So we're not doing the skids, we're doing an actual stop block. Uh, for construction, the piles will all be driven, driven with a pneumatic hammer, um, so there will not be any hydraulic fluid, and they will keep the, um, the compressor up in the, um, in the upland area and then run the hose to wherever they're driving the piles. Uh, we did receive comments from DMF. They had four comments um, to address them. The first one is they're specifying a, that it should be a one and a half to one ratio, um, height to width which I think they were just reading the plan incorrectly because we do clearly call that out. Um, six foot minimum separation from salt marsh to bottomless stringers, one and a half to one height to width ratio. And then also the, um, they said that they don't want skids on the flow. They, they'd rather have stop locks, which is exactly what we're proposing. Mm -hmm. uh, they also had a condition about only bringing a barge in to do work at high tide or two hours on either side of high tide. Not an issue in this case. Um, the contractor is, does not intend to use a barge for any of the work. And then also, um, the um, they recommended a silt curtain to be in place when doing the work, um, doing this work. Um, I the silt curtain, you know, if, if that's something that at a consensus the commission would like to see, we'll gladly do it. But you really don't get a lot of siltation um, when you're driving a pile. Um, I think it would probably cause more siltation just if it go, rests down in the mud flat and it comes back up. And also with the method of construction where there's no heavy equipment in that area, um, where there could be an oil spill or an oil leak, um, I think you're better off without it. Um, we And we feel this project can be approved by the commission because it's designed in accord, accordance with the DEP guidelines and it's similar to other docks that have been permitted in the area recently. Um, this is our first step in the uh, permitting phase. We have filed with ZBA and we have a meeting coming up on March 7th. And then following local permits, it will require approvals from DEP Waterways and Army Corps of Engineers. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff, Army Corps of Engineers, you normally don't have to seek approval. What's unusual about this project that requires that? Um, there, there's nothing unusual. I, I think we always go to Army Corps. It's rarely mentioned, for example, in Little Harbor. The other, the other project, I don't believe we talk about getting approval from the Army Corps of Engineers. Maybe I'm wrong. Okay, I'll, I'll look into that. If we don't need to, we, we certainly uh, won't. I, I think they do, Eric. I think they okay. just sometimes just mention it and mentioned. sometimes don't. Yeah. It's a question whether it's brought up at the discussion, Chris, that's all. Oh, understood. <laughs> I think it depends on where you do the, the uh, piling installations, Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong. So if you go past, I think it's mean low water and it's technically, don't they consider that, you know, dredging in a way where they would need an Army Corps permit? Or I, I, I know with chapter 91, obviously the mean high water, but with Army Corps, I don't know the difference. I can double check that though. But a handful of dock permits do also need an Army Corps permit in addition to chapter 91. Yeah, I'll double check with some of the other engineers in my office. Uh, you know, like I said, normally we file with DEP Waterways and Army Corps concurrently, but if that is not necessary, then we we won't. Jeff, you're going to be using you won't be using skids. You'll be using something else. You called it a stop lock, or what was that? What was the term you used? Yep, there will be uh, four piles driven at each corner of the float, and then there'll be a horizontal board going across them, and the dock will sit right on that, keeping keeping the um, the dock one and a half feet above the mud flat. Why should we like that more than having it sit on the bottom on the, uh, what do they call it, the, the elevated skids? Um, that We used to use the, the, the skids and, yeah. you know, they keep the dock a foot and a half off, but every time the dock comes down, those skids sit in the mud and they stir up the, the silt. Um, so you, th this, is, this is certainly a better approach. 
Charlotte, if I'm not wrong, it's what one of the recommendations made by DEP, is it not? By DMF, yes. By DMF? Yeah. Yeah, they normally oh, can, fish, um, yeah. they normally do issue the uh, recommendation about the one and a half to one height to width ratio, and then the um, the uh, what do they call them, Jeff? They're the stop blocks. Stop blocks, yeah. At least I've seen that on a handful of DMF letters so far. That seems to be some of their consistent uh, recommendations to have float stops to ensure that the float remains at least one and a half feet above the sediment at low tide. I think that's a great idea. We should do it for all projects. Why can't, I assume we can't do it for all projects, Charlotte. Is that is there a reason for that? I don't know if we can't, but uh, we definitely have the, you know, ability to issue, you know, require, you know, to, to require the project to comply with DMF's recommendations. We have a template uh, order, uh, we have a template condition in our order of conditions um, template that, you know, all conditions from DMF need to be complied with. So um, we normally do like, DMF's recommendations in most cases. Yeah, what I'm saying here is that the engineer who's in charge of this has said that the stop locks are is a better solution than the mm -hmm. skids. I, I'm willing to run with that. So it means any project that comes forward, we should sure. forget about the skids that go stop locks, right? Sure. So an engineering yeah. viewpoint. Yeah, sorry to answer your question. Yes, sir. Any <laughs> other projects we have going tonight? Correct. Jeff, could I, we see the, could you show us the, the elevation of the, the uh, pier again, please? So what, what is the, what is the, the um, column spacing on this? Uh, 10 feet. 10 feet. Jeff, did you say that this um, the float will be uh, removed seasonally and stored? Um, I did not say that, but I would expect that to be a condition. Charlotte, that's built into our conditions for docks, is it not? Yeah. Um, we are finalizing our updates, but for now, we should probably put that as a special condition for, for our dock projects. Okay. So that gets stored in an upland area, not on the marsh itself. That's also required for our regulations. Yeah. Charlotte, could you explain the one and a half times ratio here as it pertains to the measurements we have in front of us now? Where do I see the one and a half? Oh, I always have, I have to look really closely at this, but um, uh, I believe Jeff, it's where you yeah, look at Jeff, the. Uh, can, it's hard. can we see the uh, Jeff? Can you zoom in just a tad? Uh, it's where you have no the. It's where you have the yeah the six and the five feet minimum in regards to the elevation. So when you look at those numbers, uh, the the ratio has to be one and a half to one. And um, it looks like Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like at the top where you're first coming onto the pier, and then where you have the five foot minimum at five point four feet. Right. Isn't yeah. That showing. You, yeah. Can you see my screen right now? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, this note here. Sorry, we, we, I don't know if we see your arrow. All right, so you node bottom left. Yep. Did you say bottom left? Oh, I'm, when I'm, I'm looking at the right screen, in on it. let me let me reshare that because I was zoomed right okay. in. Uh, I was looking at something different. Okay, can okay, you so see the my six cursor minimum now? separation from the salt stringer is one and a half to one height yeah. ratio. I understand the six foot minimum. Where is the ratio playing out? What are the numbers am I looking at to give us a ratio? The, the width of the dock is, yeah. is, six, is four feet. Okay. So six feet is one and a half of times four. That's a hard one, yeah. You're right, Chris. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. The letter from DMF uh, has six comments, not, uh, not four. And two of the first two are are different um, than the ones that I've seen in the past. And they were referring to a, a 2022 study that referring to the negative impacts of piers and um, pilings on the shellfish. <clears throat> um, 
it's a bit of a different tone than the letters that I've seen in my uh, couple of years here, but it's the previous ones uh, were more giving directions about how to do it. This is very clearly um, the first comment is, is you know, calling about uh, <clears throat> both avoidable and unavoidable conditions that will leave, uh, you know, permanent impacts to the shellfish habitat, um, which is kind of a uh, flag to me. And, you know, this is, um, it's a direct, it's the most direct type of project that, you know, into the resources that we're, that we're here to look at. So, um, I don't know, do, do any other commissioners uh, see the, the DMF letter? It's, yeah, I, I yeah. Said, can, um, can you scroll right, uh, to the right, Jeff, to show us where uh, the pilings will actually uh, go into the, the mud? Uh, obviously, in the salt, um, the, the marsh itself, there are no shellfish, except perhaps in the ditches, but uh, in the mudflats, there would be shellfish. So it looks like there's four piles going in, actually eight. If you count the ones for the float itself, yeah. <clears throat> so when they talk about that in that comment is best management practices, um, meaning when you install these piles, it's it's limited disturbance, permanent disturbance to where the piles are driven. Um, but how to how to minimize that impact when you're installing them? And in this case, the contractor who's doing it won't be bringing in any heavy equipment. It's all done by the pneumatic hammer that I mentioned with no hydraulics in the area. So it's really kind of the minimal impact approach. And they also talk about leachates from the pressure treatment. Uh, the type of material that will be used is um, the material recommended by the DEP and their guidelines for small toxin piers. I believe it says, I'm looking up now, but non-arsenic um, pressure, treat, pressure treated material. Jeff, as far as the ratio of one and a half, um, if your height goes down to five feet, how does that one and a half ratio work out? I assume you have, have you made the, um, the pier in narrower? No, we're, we're keeping, so I, I think this, so this comment is what I think confused the DMF when they looked at the plant. Um, in this area, mean high water is higher than the marsh. So the pier will be six feet above the marsh. There's a separate requirement where we have to provide five feet of clearance above mean high water to allow public access under the pier. Yeah, but I'm still confused. If it's four feet wide, one and a half times that, as Chris pointed out to me, is six feet. And I see five foot height. Where, where do I see the one and a half? Uh, what am I missing here? All right, so where, where the confusion is on that is that that leader is pointing to mean high, the mean high water elevation in that area, not the salt marsh, which is down here. So there's two, two separate requirements here. We have to be six feet above the salt marsh, which we will be. And we also have to be five feet above mean high water. Okay. Which will be. Chris, did you need any other clarification on comment number one? No, um, I'm just kind of bringing it up as uh, it seems to be like a different tone than the letters we've seen from DMF in the past on similar projects. And they do, you know, they're referencing uh, 2022, which is a more recent report on, um, you know, on best practices and the impacts of these types of projects. So it's, I just thought it was worth consideration from the commission. Um, you know, we spoke, we spoke last time about, you know, the, we've, we've allowed it in the past. So we kind of are a bit stuck in the, 
in the machine of letting these continue to go. But I mean, there is new information coming out being referenced by DMF here. Um, Trying to find the article online, Chris, but unfortunately I'm only getting the abstract, but I can try to locate that paper. There is one from 2018 by similar authors. Um, so this might be, a, you know, obviously more of an updated uh, research article. So I can try to get that and see what BMPs they recommend. But I would assume DMF is obviously looking at this paper and going by, you know, the recommendations from this paper to a certain degree. Um, they did mention, obviously, you know, some of the core in, um, variables that we look at are the height to width ratio, you know, being greater than one to one, and they recommend 1.5 to one as well. Um, also the orientation of the dock with, from a north to south orientation is better than east to west. And then um, also the spacing of the pilings, you know, maximizing the spacing as best as possible to obviously min uh, minimize the amount of pilings going in and the impact on the salt marsh. So those are some of the three core variables right now. And I'm curious to see if that 2022 paper has any other BMPs, um, but, yeah, I'll try to find it. What was the there was there was a special condition someone brought up. What is that one? What was the special condition? Uh, we we uh, wanted the float, uh, the seasonal float and gangway to be stored uh, upland in an area uh, out of the okay. resource area. Okay. Charlotte, are you asking that we wait before we before we make a motion? Wait on. Um, you trying to find something? Oh no, no, I was just stating that I was trying to find it for you guys to read it during the meeting, but I can't. Okay. I can only get the abstract. All right. So, so Jeff, what is the if, if you've got eight piles in the uh, mudflat where which is shellfish habitat? What's the area that then would be disturbed. I would assume it's pretty small. The, are these four by fours or six by sixes or what? Yeah, they're six by sixes, so 0.25 square feet each. Yeah. And there's actually 10 of them. So 2.5 square feet. Carol, you can pull the, the paper up if you go to the uh, <clears throat> the citations in the letter and just click on the link. That, that's oh, perfect. Up. Okay. So that, that sounds pretty minimal, um, mm -hmm. uh, two and a half square feet, uh, might be disturbing uh, a dozen clams here with that. Hmm. Oh, wow, look at that. Thank you, Chris. Are there clams in the river, Tom? Probably uh, soft shell clams there, yeah. It's it's primarily fresh water, isn't it, Tom? No, no. It is. It's it, it. It's probably. I mean, you're close enough to the harbor there, so it's probably you know pretty close to what the uh, harbor salinity is. I mean, you've got you've got um, Spartina growing on the on the yeah. uh, salt marsh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely a saltwater environment. Okay. Jeff, could you do, a, do me a favor and could you review what the construction uh, modus operandi is going to be? Because there's no barge, all right? How is this thing going to be constructed, put in place without disturbing unnecessarily the salt marsh? So they will, um, you know, they'll, they'll park in Black Horse and that area, that's where they'll have a compressor running that, that um, you know, powers the pneumatic hammer. And then they have 600 feet of hose, so more than enough for this project. So they can keep the uh, keep that compressor up in the upland area. And then it's a tripod, which they carry out by hand, set up, mount the hammer, and drive drive the uh, pile in. So they'll do that. They'll they will walk on the salt marsh to do that. Once they get the piles installed, they they then put horizontal boards um, off the ground. And they kind of make a temporary catwalk. So at that point on, they're building the decking without stepping on the salt marsh. Okay. Any further comments? No. 
No comments from the public. I'd like to close the public hearing, make a motion to close the public hearing and issue an order of conditions for NOI 23-04 with the special condition that, um, Charlotte, what was the special condition on this again? Uh, that the seasonal uh, float uh, gangway. That yeah. That the, that the gangway and float are removed seasonal during the, the off season and stored in an upland area and not on the marsh. Um, do I have a second? Second. Having a motion and a second to issue an order of conditions for NOI 23-04. We'll take a roll call vote. Will Ashton? Will Ashton, aye. Tom Bell? Tom Bell, aye. Kathy Berrigan? Kathy Berrigan, aye. Eric Eisenhower? Eric Eisenhower, nay. Chris McIntyre? Chris McIntyre, nay. Oh, Chris McFarland, aye. This vote passes uh, 4 to 0 all right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, our next hearing this evening is NOI 23-02, continued from February 2nd. This, too, was a pier gangway and float at 30 Beach Street. Goodness. Good evening. Can uh, I doesn't appear like my camera is working. Can you see me? We can see your photograph. We see somebody <laughs> there. I, I'm not sure what I saw, but there was something there. <laughs> <laughs> That's a picture in Nashville. Uh, my. We've had some. There, there you we go. go. There you We're go. a little slow here. Our recent connection, I think. Uh, good evening, for the record. My name is Caroline Reese of Merrill Engineers and Land Surveyors. I'm representing the applicant, Peter Hobson, and homeowner Susan Hobson. I believe they're both uh, in attendance of the meeting. I see Susan, and I think Peter, for a notice of intent to construct a pier, gangway, and float at 30 Beach Street. This was continued from the February 2nd meeting um, to address some of the commission comments as well as allow time to review and address the Division of Marine Fisheries recommendations um, in a letter dated February 2nd, the date of the last meeting. So with that, um, I have reviewed the DMF letter as, as I'm sure you have, submitted a response and a revised site plan, which I could, uh, Attempt to share the screen again, Charlotte, if you want. Yeah, sure. Thank you. And as we speak, I can go through a couple of the changes. I haven't gotten the message yet. I share screen. Okay, here we go. All right, are we good? Can we see it? Yes. Terrific, thank you. So of the changes made, um, we reduced the size of the float to a 12 by 16. I believe that was a commission comment. Um, and in response to the DMF comments, we have added uh, the construction notes, two construction notes in the upper corner to um, limit activities uh, from a barge to two hours before um, two hours before and after mean high water, and that land-based equipment should be prohibited from being fueled on site. Mm -hmm. um, for the dock, we also increased the plank spacing from three quarters of an inch to an inch um, to allow light penetration across the cross section. And uh, with that, I guess I can return it for questions. I know there have been some. Caroline, it's Caroline, yes. isn't it? We just heard a few minutes ago that um, a barge isn't necessary. And I find that a, a barge to be unnecessary disturbance to the environment. Why do we include a barge when it's not necessary? Um, I don't think a barge is required. That was a note they requested. Uh, the contractor, I haven't, I don't think they've gotten construction estimates yet. Or, uh, Keith Wallow, I don't know if a barge would be necessary. Um, 
that was just a requirement from DMF if there is barge activity to limit it. So we, we don't have a final plan then. Why are we reviewing it? Uh, final plan, we do. Uh, I could make that a note on the plan, a condition not to include or to use a pneumatic pump. I didn't include construction. Um, we do have the contractor on the call. Um, sorry, Carolyn, to interrupt. You said sure. um, right. I'm here if you need me. Um, we can, I can promote him, Mr. Chair, if you want to hear him speak. That would be fine. Okay. You can just tell us whether he's using a barge or not. Hear me? Yes. Hi. Hi. Keith Wallow, have a morning. Um, <clears throat> We haven't signed a contract or anything yet, but if I am the vendor that or the contractor that's going to be building it, there won't be a budge. You can't get a budge into Little Harbor anyway. Yeah, exactly. So I would have thought same, that was, that's same true. Scenario as the last one, it would be a tripod with a pneumatic hammer head and the the um, compressor would be up in the parking lot so that it would just run a hose okay. down. Okay. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. So, Charlotte, I understand that part of the DMF letter on this one also recommended the, the stop blocks. Is that correct? Yes, uh, they did say, um, yep, they recommend that pile supported float stops be installed to ensure the float remains at least one and a half feet above the sediment at low tide. So same comment as we just saw with the last hearing. And then right. they also had the one and a half to one height ratio recommendation, height to width okay. ratio. And and does does are both of those included in this application now? No, if you'd like me to speak. I, I, I mean, we could adjust for that. Um, stop blocks, it's an either or for the skids. Mm -hmm. We can certainly consider it. Those go on the corner of a float and it's more of a point load. Um, with the tide going up and down, sit on the substrate, as opposed to skids that balance the load more, you have four points that can put more pressure at the four points and create divots and then the dock could continue to sink if that ground you know i'm not doing studies but the substrate if the substrate's soft you're supporting the whole dock on four point loads i feel like it's an either or if the commission prefers that i i think it may be a trade-off this is not a shellfish area the skids we like them because they're more stable and the weight's distributed and the substrate you know it's kind of wobbly. Um, they don't hit everywhere, but the point loads certainly will hit. It's a four point load weight system. Um, if that's what you prefer, and if you'd be willing to make that a condition of approval, we can certainly change it. We've just found skids slightly more stable. It's just a distributed load, not digging in. So I don't know if there's, I don't know if there's research on what's better. So the 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 previous applicant. Um, designed it using stop blocks but actually actually the stop blocks were permanent stop blocks and the and the the float would land on the blocks for, versus then, being connected to the blocks and having it as you mentioned like table legs um but, yes but they'll bear weight and could slowly like you know uh uh what do you call it sink into the substrate as they bear weight. And they are permanent structures. Um, mm -hmm. A seasonal dock, the skids come completely out in the winter seasons and maybe the area has time to restore itself. Um, I'm not sure if you, if you have a preference for the permanent stop blocks, but they well, do- Well, it's, it's, it's really us following the recommendation of uh, mm -hmm. DMF. So I think, I think that, is, that would be a condition. Okay. And as far as the the width to height ratio, where do we stand there? I would say it, it's a trade off. You know that that dock also had railings along the length. You're getting up pretty high when you raise it. It's a recommendation. Um, mm -hmm. The end of that study does say that you know as high as you make it, the higher it is, the better um, as far as light penetration. Um, we're not quite a north south orientation we're we're in between but um the higher you go there becomes a safety issues where i would lean towards railings i would lean towards more railings which is then an aesthetic obstruction and um we 
the study does cite that Logan study that um, increasing plank spacing could be looked at as an alternate means to um, let in light. That was a recommendation for future studies that hasn't been done, but we suggested increase the sp plank spacing. So do, um, do, you have, do you have a section or elevation of the overall pier? Uh, the profile, maybe? Yes. Sure. And, you know, we're for about 20 feet, 16 feet, we have the 1.5 ratio. Um, I mean, it's certainly possible to raise it. You just get a higher structure. I'd want to put mm -hmm. railings longer. It's, it gets pretty high. Um, DEP only requires the one-to-one. -one. Uh, DMF is making a recommendation. That's up to you, but uh, if the higher you go, it becomes more of a safety issue. We increase the plank spacing. It's a short dock. I mean, we looked at putting it in other mm -hmm. parts of the yard to maintain the existing steps, um, putting it off to the side, but where it is now with the shape of the slot, it's, it's really over about, I think it's what, 30 feet of salt marsh. We really tried to minimize impact on salt marsh by mm -hmm. sacrificing those steps and going over the concrete. I mean, they could have put it off to the side and had the 25 feet clearance. Um, we got about, what, 14 piles. It's a small structure. And I do think with a higher height, it becomes more of an obstruction and a bit of a safety fall. So, don't you only need to increase it one foot to get the one and a half to one? It's five feet now, you need to be six. You do, yeah. It's, that would change the need for a railing going from five feet to six feet. I, I don't know. I would argue we really could probably use a railing more now. I'd like to see it. Um, I think the gentleman who's residing in the house now is older. Uh, it's just they had a railing the whole length on the previous dock. It's 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 a bit of a balancing act on taste and preference and height. But DP still asks for one-to-one -one minimum ratio of a salt marsh. Um, it's a study. I don't know what the... Could you, could you show the profile again, please? Certainly. So, so your railing is only beginning at... Uh... Yeah, about for the last 20 feet or so. Mm -hmm. Just as we're getting approaching that steeper portion, coming down this angled ramp um, where it gets higher. And just Caroline, do Caroline, yes. you have a criteria as to where and when you need railing in terms of angle or height that one could fall you know, to get at the details of safety as opposed to whether one likes it or not. I would, I would have thought you would have, you know, at, at such and such a height you would demand that there be a railing for safety purposes. Is that the case? No, we went 20 feet to make a clean section of railing and towards the end, just, I don't know, balancing your stuff. There's, I, I, I think someone could fall at two feet. I think someone could fall at 10 feet and be fine. It's, it's pretty subjective. Um, I've heard trying to minimize the aesthetic, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, impingement on the environment, um, you know, railings all across would certainly be a much more substantial structure to look at. We tried to come but, down that ramp, give a little bit of landing, give a couple, few feet, and then start a railing. But the uh, building code of 30 inches above doesn't apply here, I guess? No. No, okay. it doesn't. Not for, not for docks. Uh, these pilings, will they be uh, driven to refusal? I would ask Keith that. I'm still on yes. The answer is yes. And and if you were to put in uh, four pilings to uh, put in um, float stops, those would also be driven to refusal? Correct. So the issue of the weight of the dock uh, further driving the piles into the substrate is unlikely or likely? You're asking me? Um, yes. Well, either yeah. you were- uh, Mr. Unlikely. Yeah, okay. I thought, I, I think there were um, 
stop blocks that you could just put on the bottom of the dock that would be removed with the dock. If you're talking permanent structures, you do, that's fine, but you're gonna have four permanent structures that are gonna be visible at low tide um, that will be there year round yes. or you know when exposed. Again, Keith, you, you wouldn't, uh, what, what would your recommendation be if looking at this plan and seeing a, a 12 inch maximum diameter pile? Um, I would drive six by sixes for this entire dock. Okay. I think there's a couple of different engineers out there that just make that a, you know, 12 inch or 14 inches, the maximum. And yeah. then the contractor can pick what they're going to use to. to yeah, that's why. That's dock. why I was asking your opinion on. That's yeah, I, I do six. Okay. These would all be six by sixes, in my opinion. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'd expect that. That's also for the coverage in the salt marsh that we are not going over by any means. You know, mm -hmm. that's their safety. Um, so, if you were to drive six by sixes into the uh, mud flat, there, uh, are they going to stay vertical? Or are they going to have a tendency to um, stray from the vertical with time? So I can answer that two different ways. Um, David Dwyer, who's on the Gulf River, he has what the four stops, if you want to call them, however you guys want to call them. We call them a cradle mm -hmm. because we put the, the two by eights around it. So when the float comes down, the, the weight is spread out on the entire thing. Um, we installed his dock, I think, five years ago. Um, they've never sunk and I've never had an issue with them. <clears throat> and we just drove um, the stops that we're talking about are going to be driven at um, Aaron's house, which you guys just approved recently. And we drove the pilings that went out into the mud at the end of the dock and we got them in 13 feet. So I don't think there's any once the thing's in the ground 13 feet, it's in so deep into the, the structure underneath the mud that the chances of it tipping over are almost nil. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, hurricanes and stuff like that, you know, I can't control that kind of stuff. But normal everyday wear and tear, it, they're not going to tip over. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions or comments? Well, I think uh, we should we should be paying yeah. close attention to that those DMF uh, recommendations yep. here, uh, particularly mm -hmm. since they've been updated, and we've got to assume that that's probably the best management practice that that uh, we've got now. Yeah, I'm going to say kind of uh, joined the the Eric camp and and kind of enough is enough, especially with these. Uh, you know, I'm reading these comments in this paper from DMF, and it's, you know, it is referencing BMPs, but it's also talking about the cumulative damage of, you know, these, all these uh, peers, and um, I'm I'm going to continue to uh, to vote against these as well with Eric. Yeah. Uh, Chris yeah, and Eric, yeah. just to, just to kind of note that you know, as commissioners, we do have to look at every project objectively. So we can't, you Sorry. know, say that I'm, I'm never going to. Uh, my, my feeling is negative in general, I would say. Uh, okay. I, I was listening. I did review all these documents. <clears throat> I think what's really unfortunate is that we have regulations which um, have very strong indications that we have to defend the aesthetics of the environment, the wetlands. But they're not upheld by the bylaws. There's no, there's nothing specific in the bylaws. I understand that's the case. Uh, Charlotte, is that right? Uh, sorry, Eric. What, what was your question? Oh, I mean, the... Yeah, our rules and regs say mm -hmm. we have to defend the um, the aesthetics, the yep. attractiveness, the naturalness right. of the wetlands. But in the bylaws, there's nothing specific that we can stand on. Is that correct? Yes, unfortunately, the, we do mention aesthetics as part of our wetlands values in the bylaw, but it's not clearly defined in the bylaw, nor could I find it in detail in okay. uh, our rules and regulations. So if we did want to 
look at any sort of future performance standards for that. We can consider that, but for now we do not have anything to measure or evaluate aesthetics and aesthetics is not um, also in the Wetlands Protection Act. You expressed it much more elegantly than myself. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, I'd be inclined to, to definitely tighten those up, uh, but under the circumstances, mm -hmm. I feel like we've got to stay within the boundaries that are bylaws and regulations. What does that mean, Commissioner Bell? Well, uh, our bylaws uh, have we, us defending aesthetics. Yeah, it's undefined, Eric. I mean, that's yeah, that, no. and 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 I I think that I think that uh, that's unfortunate that to put uh, vague language in when when we should have really whoever did it should have been far more specific, and it would give us a, a better standing for uh, objecting to some of these structures that are going in and and we just don't have it yeah uh, and so i'm all for changing them actually i mean i'd like to see that get tightened up and uh i'd like to see uh some of these uh, this proliferation of docks stop but i i don't think we have the authority to stop them no well and dp dp would override overrule us anyway so yeah because they're all they're according all to favorite. my come according to my come tom from the satellite photograph there are 36 on little harbor so yeah. it's not a small problem and it's been going on for quite a while obviously it's nothing new here how many more properties can build them there's probably as many <laughs> left that could be built huh yeah as many as there are houses yeah discouraging yeah. well the 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 one um the one concern I have here is that um, DMF recommends a one and a half to one ratio. Um, Caroline Reese has said that if if we were going to enforce that, then they would they would look at putting a handrail, which may be more obstructive. Um, I I do think five feet is pretty considerable anyway, especially if there's someone elderly in the house. I think that chances are. At some point, they're going to want to put a handrail on this. Um, I mean, if if you feel you need it when when you're when you're at the six foot or seven foot, you probably feel you need it at the five foot. So, I, I'm a little concerned it's going to come back later with the handrails anyway. So, I'm I'm wondering if maybe we should consider just going to the six feet right off the bat and realizing we're going to end up with handrails. I support what you're saying, Chris. I think there's got to be a handrail here for safety's reason. We well, we can't, we can't, we can't make them put a handrail, but I, I do feel like at some point it's going to happen. And so, but what we can do is we can use the the DMF um, recommendation for a six foot mm -hmm. elevation. Although I'm, I must say, five feet's an awful lot of clearance. I, I imagine you're going to get a fair amount of light under there anyway. So. Yeah. I don't know. I'm, I'm just speaking out loud so people consider options here. I mean, may I? Yes. Um, I, I'd certainly like the homeowners um, maybe opinion on extending the railing and raising. I, I was going off of trying to minimize the obstruction to the aesthetic, which I kind of picked up on last time. And when you raise the dock, you have a bigger, grander structure in the way. And uh, the 1.5 is a recommendation, um, but understood. D yeah, DP. So it was a balancing act, um, you know, from our perspective, can make it higher. Add railings. We're trying to kind of minimize the visual impact, I guess. Um, and that's kind of what I gathered. But it is a bit of a balancing act. And again, um, okay. Uh, Susan, or well, I could talk to them later and raise mm -hmm. it and revise it. Well, I, I mean, I, I'm just throwing it out there to the rest of the commission to see what they're feeling on it. Mm -hmm. is. I mean, they have put a little extra separation between the boards, whether or not that provide, you know, if that truly increases the amount of 
of light that's hitting the ground. I'm not quite sure. Um, I think it's probably pretty close to being what's necessary. So anyway, any other comments? No. Tom, Kathy, anyone else? No. No? Okay. Then then I'm not going to I'm not gonna push that issue then. Um I'm going to make a motion to close the public hearing and issue an order of conditions for NOI 23-02. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Having a motion second to issue an order of conditions for NOI 23-02 at 30 Beach Street. We'll take a roll call vote. Will Ashton? Will? Will, you are muted. Will's changing a diaper. Uh, Will, can you hear us? You're muted. Yeah, sorry, I had to step away for a second. Okay. Will, I may, there was a, a motion and a second to issue an order of conditions for 23 02 at 30 Beach Street. Um, uh, Will Ash and I. Okay. Tom Bell. Tom Bell, I. Kathy Berrigan. Kathy Berrigan, I. Eric Eisenhower. Eric Eisenhower, nay. Chris McIntyre. Chris McIntyre, nay. Chris McFarlane, I. That vote passes 4 to 0. Thank you. And, uh, Thank you very much. Sorry, Mr. Chair. I think we do need a variance for work in the 50, oh, yes. for at least that small portion for the stairs. Mm -hmm. uh, the small portion of the it's like just the just the uh, the stairs right before the salt marsh. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, make a motion to issue a variance for work within the fifty foot buffer. Do I have a second? Second. May I have a uh, roll call vote, please. Will Ashton. Will Ashton, I. Tom Bell. Tom Bell, I. Kathy Berrigan. Kathy Berrigan, I. Eric Eisenhower. Eric Eisenhower, nay. Chris McIntyre. Chris McIntyre, nay. Chris McFarland, aye. That vote passes 4 to 0. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have a question for Charlotte. Yes. Charlotte, our regs say we have to be very specific when we ask a variance as to mm -hmm. which portions of the bylaw we're going to, uh, mm -hmm. we're going to not consider. And Correct, yeah. And we don't do that very well, I don't think. I apologize, we're trying to be consistent here, but yes, well, the, I, I we think, do need to list the specific section to issue the variance, yes. Yeah, I think we need to list what by what portion of the bylaws, unit by unit, we should, um, we're going on record as saying, we're not going to live up to, or we're gonna walk around or give permission. All right, mm -hmm. we don't do that. We just say, we're, we're gonna have a variance for all the wetland regulations. And I, yeah. don't that's in, I don't think that's in spirit of the, the document I have in front of me. So. Yeah, no, we we do the um we we can list the section numbers if that's easier, but we do say a variance for work within the 50. That's one of our regulations that we do not, you know, it's a no disturbance policy. Um so we can list I can list um I can find the specific sections instead of saying work within the 50. We can say we give a variance for this section of our regulations. Um and then for the resource area alteration that's section 32B-1. <laughs> I only know that cuz I looked it up re really recently. Um, but if we want to do that to be very specific, you know, we can definitely do that. Okay. Okay. We'll so, look at that in the future. So, so uh, while we're on this dark subject, can we, can we come? Can we? Can we take care of the hearings and we'll come back? Yeah, sure. <laughs> All right. Let's just just table it until hearings are over tonight, and we'll sure. come back to uh, issues of docs. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Our next hearing this evening is a show cause hearing for 76 Lambert Lane continued from January 19, 2023. Do we have anyone in the audience tonight? Um, not that I can see, unless anyone wishes to raise their hand, but unfortunately we do not have updates for this one. Okay, then we will continue this hearing until, we're gonna continue it till the March 23rd 
um, hearing. Okay, Charlotte? Yep. Okay. Just wrote it down. Our, our last hearing this evening is a discussion uh, revolving around 256 and 258 North Main Street. This uh, discussion was continued from um, February 2nd. And I think Brendan's here. Mm -hmm. Hey, Brendan. Hey, how you doing? Good. Um, so for the record, Brenda Sullivan with Merrill Associates uh, representing um, uh, Janice Batts of 256 North Main Street. Um, so for any of the stand from the last hearing, you will look in, because originally we had modeled both addresses, 258 and 256 um, in the stormwater. Um, so I did break out 256 um, as a standalone model. Um, and the results um, I have summarized along with the letter um, dated um, February 13th. And Charlotte, do all the uh, pre and post they conditions do. Yeah. meet or, or, mm -hmm. or exceed? Yes. Okay. In this report that Brendan provided, from what I can see, yes. Um, mm -hmm. Some slight differences, but there are some, you know, the, the post development numbers are slightly lower by like 0 0.03, 0 0.04. <laughs> um, so, but they match. They're, they're you know. Okay. Any questions Did, from commissioners? No. Brendan, you understand what our concern was, right? Um, not really sure to tell you the truth. <laughs> well, I, when, when the when the project started, it was it was one property. Yes, but, cor but, cor correct. And and so and I not to you know not throwing anybody into the bus here, but I think when the other property was sold, um, and that permit was issued as an administrative permit, it probably should have been issued as a full stormwater permit because it would have been two administrative permits next to each other. Um, and especially where where we originally, you know, because Mrs. Batts owned both properties at one point, and that's when we that's when we did the stormwater permit in the back. Right. Um, and so subsequently, during the project, she sold the house in the front even before she built the house in the back. <laughs> so it was kind of a um, so in my mind, it was almost and I, and I think it, it's written in the bylaws that you can't fit, you know, quote unquote, phase projects, you know, so correct. I think, you know, people driving by there saw, geez. That's not an administrative project. That's that's you know that's ten thousand square feet of disturbance. You know, well, yeah, it's two forty nine hundred square feet of disturbance put together. You know, so right. I think that's 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 what I think that's what the, um, the precipice of the show cause was. Yeah, that's I mean, we, right. we, yeah, I mean, basically, we just need to understand how how um, you know it, it started off as a as a single property, but you know, when it came for certificate of compliance, it came in as two properties. And we're just trying to, under, we were just trying to understand um, kind of what the end results of each property were or, or, or one property, but it, sure. it was, it was kind of hard to differentiate between. Yeah. No, any other, any, any questions by commissioners? No. Tom? No. Okay. There's, there's no float stops out here. Oh, okay. Fair enough. No one's that's smiling. All, Come on. That's, that's what we needed. <laughs> I'm sorry. Was that a joke? <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> Excuse me. I have, to, I have to check my, my wetland regulations to find out what, what where jokes are allowed at these days. <sighs> Page 17. We're all human, Eric. Come on. <laughs> I know. Okay. Thank you for coming by and clarifying for us no problem thank you oh wait we're going to take do we oh are we issuing the no so so neither property has requested a coc at this time there's still pending work to be done specifically more on the 258 north main property in the front um but brendan i i don't know if the the uh the owner for 256 has been able to put together anything yet but from what i saw i think there was still a little bit of final grading and site stabilization to be done yeah, a little bit. They they ran under similar to the thirty four Bancroft. They ran under the under the gun mm -hmm. in the fall and was they, they just actually just had to put hay over the uh, septic system, so they weren't able to get grass established. 
um, at the end of the growing season, although you wouldn't know it from today, but <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, once we wrap it up in the spring, we'll, so this, so yeah, so Chris, this wasn't a, um, a request for certificate of compliance. It was a request for, uh, it was actually a show cause. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which we closed and then yeah. followed up with discussion. Yes. Very good. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, our next sort of business this evening, our minutes for approval. There are five uh, sets of minutes that had been distributed November 22nd, December 1st, December 15th, January 5th, and February 2nd. What happened to January 19th? Um, I can double check. I'm, I, I'm not sure if we already approved that one at the last meeting, but oh, is that, okay. I can double check that one. That's right. Um, so at least for 1122, do you want me to go through attendance for each one, Chris, or just want to vote on them or? Um, I'd like to, I'd like if, if there's a group of people that are all available for a group of these, let's do it as one thing. Um, who so, was who, who absent when? Who was absent the November 22nd? Uh, everybody was here but Will. Okay. So five five commissioners. Who who was who was absent on the December first? Uh, I'm going through all my notes. <laughs> December first was um, Will was missing and Eric was missing. Okay, December fifteenth. Uh, December fifteenth was um, Eric was missing and Chris McIntyre was missing. Okay, uh, January 5th. Uh, Kathy was um, missing or absent. Sorry, it's probably okay. more the appropriate word. Okay, and February 2nd? February 2nd was all of us. Okay. Um, can, I, can we just do it as a whole saying that you're only voting for those that you were at? I agree to that. Okay. So um so for for those here, we're gonna I'm gonna make a motion to accept the minutes from November twenty second, December first, December fifteenth, January fifth, and February second, with each of us voting just on the hearings that they were at. Do I have a second? Second. second. Having a motion and second to approve the minutes. We'll take a roll call vote. Will Ashton. Will Ashton, aye. Tom Bell. Tom Bell, aye. Kathy Berrigan. Kathy Berrigan, aye. Eric Eisenhower. Eric Eisenhower, aye. Chris McIntyre. Chris McIntyre, aye. Chris McFarlane, aye. Minutes are approved. Six zero zero. Okay. Certificates of compliance. You guys are going to like this. I needed to continue all of these. Um, <laughs> hey, hey. I'll just give a quick here. update uh, that the Ledgewood Drive ones are part of a sub uh, subdivision a long time ago. So I'm looking into the details of that. Uh, Bancroft Road, as Brendan briefly mentioned, uh, they submitted an updated as built with the um, final BMPs for stormwater, uh, but they still need to do final site regrading and stabilization. So they will come back in the spring uh, when that is done. Um, and Brendan also reran the numbers, but we can just review all that when they come back. And then 187 Atlantic Ave, um, I am waiting on the final status of the um, mitigation plantings and invasive species removal that was required per the order of conditions. Um, there's also a second order of conditions for this property in 2021. So both those projects, you know, since we're coming up on spring, hopefully they can finish all the plantings and then they'll come back. But for now, they've continued to March 2nd, but I have a feeling it'll get pushed back until they're done in the spring with the plantings. So. And Bancroft's continued till when? Uh, they, I recommended they just uh, come back when they're ready. Um, yeah, but we so. have to give a date for a continuance. Um, we can continue to 3-2 for now, but okay. uh, the I did tell the applicants that they just need to provide an update when they're ready to come back and then they can. Um, yeah. Ledgewood is continued to? Uh, we continued to March 2nd, both of them. 
Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, March 2nd. Yeah. All right. Very good. Do we need to vote on continuing them? No. No. Okay. Great. Uh, Charlotte, any agent updates? Uh, yes, I can go through those. Um, 91 Atlantic Ave. This was a um, notice of intent and stormwater permit to physically raise, you know, the home to be FEMA compliant. Um, they just started construction. Um, 68 Whitehead Road. These uh, they are finishing the work, but as of a couple of weeks ago, they still have to install the stormwater controls. Um, so the building inspector and I are looking into that and following up on that. They also have to finish all the landscaping and plantings. Uh, 46 Hobart. Um, Eric, your old home is no more. It's, it's <laughs> uh, gone. Demo, yep, fully demoed, pouring the foundation. Um, and I uh, have touched base with them on uh, doubling up on erosion controls uh, closest to the um, the resource area, just because of the amount of fill that they had to, uh, the amount of dirt that they had to dig up to, for that foundation. Um, I'll do 147 South Main last. Uh, 55 Gammons Road, that was the another dock project we approved. Keith had briefly mentioned at the meeting today that you know it sounded like he was already working on driving the pilings. So that should be done in the next uh, few months. Um, eight Spindrift Lane, this had a, a different address when we reviewed it. This was a stormwater permit. It was like lot five Forest Ave near 336 Forest Ave. That one is now undergoing construction. Although I will say, you know, both uh, Kathy and I had some concerns about the work being very close to the uh, IBW. Um, this is an IBW, not a BVW, and the contractor was actually confused and thought there was a DEP number. I'm like, nope, it's an IBW, and they stayed just outside of the 25-foot buffer. So I'll be watching that one closely to make sure they aren't going past where they're supposed to. Also, they kind of physically can't because the IBW is in somebody else's property. Um, and then uh, Diab Lane and Howe Road. So. <laughs> um, Three Diab Lane uh, has an updated landscaping plan that you know the chair and vice chair and I approved administratively. Um, so they are going to be finishing final grading, planting. Hopefully, they should be done by spring. Um, and uh, nine and fifteen Diab fifteen is actually closer to completion than nine because nine was held up due to uh, blasting from three Diab. So they had to wait. Um, they have been digging uh, a, a utility trench uh, in between three and nine to uh, service three and there were some concerns with erosion control so I had them replace the barriers um, in front of Howe Road to you know prevent any of the you know sediment from going into the street until that trench is buried and the stone swale is installed around it um, and then uh, Howe Road uh, 80 Howe still no updates about the driveway it looks like they poured the base coat Tom but I don't think they've finished everything yet um, so they, they just have to finish that driveway and finish all of their final grading and landscaping as well. But unfortunately, I don't have an update on that one. I thought uh, I thought the top coat's on that. It looks like. Is it on there? Okay. It, it looks it looks like it's got a top coat. Okay. I, I swear, last time I, it was, this was like months ago, but the, I know the owner had applied the base coat. I just don't, I didn't know if they applied the top coat since then. Yeah, a scratch, a scratch layer, you know, coat is okay. always looks pretty rough, you know. Okay. It, it looks pretty smooth to me. Okay. Okay. Um. But yeah, they still have to finish all the regrading, and uh, I don't think all of their gutters were fully installed at the time, but I think that's been done now. Um, and then 102 Howe Road, this is the one that's tucked in the back closest to the wetland. They had to replace all of their barriers that were immediately downgrading to the work because they got beat up uh, again. Um, and I know they're working on the pool with the contractor. Um, and then last but not least, 147 South Main. Um, Chris, I looked into it. I still can't find any changes from when we approved it versus when zoning approved it, other than that zoning table. Um, I, I talked to zoning, talked to building, looked at the records. I didn't see any other changes, um, but I'm happy to talk to Woody and see if he might know anything. Yeah, would you please? Yeah. I mean, Woody was the one who said that they were in front of them because of some kind of parking issue. Okay, I'll, I'll ask Woody, probably okay. just call him. <laughs> okay. Um, and do you want me to go through my other updates? Uh, Does anybody have any other questions on construction updates? No. No. Okay. Um, so I have a few administrative stormwater permit COC requests. So I confirmed with council that for admin COC requests, I can do it, but I obviously would still, I want to still notify you guys. So just to give you a quick update, I have three of them. 30 Windy Hill, uh, I am pending a COC like physical request um, from the engineer. Uh, 66 Jerusalem, uh, I will type up my report for that one and I'll send it to you guys. And if you guys agree with 
you know, my findings, then I can issue a administrative COC. Um, they finished the work, they stabilized the site, all the stormwater BMPs are in place. There were just some deviations with the patio stuff, but I wanted the engineer to clarify that it didn't go over 5,000 square feet, and he did. Uh, 20 old pasture, this is a pool project. Um, I just did my inspection this week, so I have to type up my report. They didn't, um, they didn't rip out some of the portion of the driveway, but then they ended up making their patio pervious. So they kind of switched impervious and pervious and um, they redid the calculations and everything still works. Um, but yeah, if you guys, I will send those to you guys once I type up my reports. And if you guys have any questions, comments or concerns before I make a decision, I'm happy to obviously entertain those as I would have for a, a permit. Um, and then the special conditions template, I'm sorry, I'm still looking into the 75% number. So I should hopefully update that for you guys next meeting and then we can make that an official template and then we can start putting in all those conditions that we just issued tonight um and then last but not least i shared this with you guys but i've been trying to collect all of the knowledge that i've tried to absorb within the last year and a half either through courses webinars etc reading papers regulations i've tried to put it all in one drive for you guys and you guys are welcome to edit that file and if you find anything interesting you can obviously drag stuff in there I will put this 2022 doc paper in there because I want to read that, but the 2018 one is in there along with guidelines from DEP, um, CZM, which is Coastal Zone Management, uh, and uh, Army Corps as well. So I'm trying to just put all the knowledge in one area for you guys, but definitely open to feedback too. Thank you. And that's it. Okay, Tom, mm -hmm. back to you. Tom, back to you on docs. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I since we can't. The, according to DEP or, or state law, we really can't deny somebody a dock. Is, that's my understanding. Is that yours, Chris? That's what yeah. I've been told by council too. That's yeah. my understanding. So, mm -hmm. but 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 uh, we can certainly tighten up our regulations. We yes, have, we have uh, right as a sovereign town to make stricter uh, bylaws for putting in these docks. And I think that uh, there's enough of us, and I, I would count myself among them, that would like to see uh, something done. It is it's getting out of hand. Yeah. Some of these are really big. They're ugly. Well, it, it, so we should be thinking about what kinds of bylaws and regulations can we put in to, if nothing else, slow it down or at least find some way to make reduce the impact. That's that's the bottom line here. How do we mm -hmm. reduce the impact in the salt marsh? Yeah. And the and our wetland bylaws, the the ABCDs under when you can deny a permit. One of the last one D is failure to avoid or prevent unacceptable, significant, or cumulative effects. Um, at, you know, at what point do these all these docks become cumulative? You know, when when are we able to look at the cumulative effects of projects that have been approved already? You know what I mean? It's like, uh, yeah. it's like the stormwater thing. It's like there, how many docks are we talking about? And, and I think the uh, the language that the new language in the DMF letter was kind of, you know, it's that was enough for me to kind of, uh, yep. at least on those two projects. Yeah. Um, there's also um, some language in our regulations that unfortunately has never been enforced and it goes against the grain with what DEP and everybody else recommends. So we have a section about salt marshes. I think it's like section 33 that literally says no alteration in the salt marsh destruction or fill. But unfortunately, whoever opened the floodgates, however many years ago for docks, pretty much upset that. And now if I, I actually asked council this, I said, if we were to deny a dock project based off of our rules and regulations that we don't allow alteration in the salt marsh, he said, we have no chance of pretty much um, yeah. defending that in court because obviously we've allowed how many dock projects at this point? Well, not we, but the town. Um, so it's unfortunate that the regulations would have hopefully in the past, maybe in a different time, they would have held up. But since someone opened the floodgates, unfortunately we can't go back on our, you know, yeah. You know, Charlotte, there's no reason to begin from ground zero on this. Uh, this whole question of docks is a hot issue up and down the, uh, the East Coast of Massachusetts, um, whether it be the Cape or whether it be Duxbury, Marshfield, Plymouth, mm -hmm. whatever. 
And I, there must be many, many towns who confront the same problem yep. that we're, we're going through right now. I would suggest you do a bit of talk within the, um, uh, the, the community that we're a part of yep. uh, and look at what other people have done and trying to find good examples um, mm -hmm. of, of effective regulations. And maybe we then can avoid yeah. to reinvent the wheel from scratch. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I was told to look at the Cape, actually. Yeah, yeah there's, there's a specific town in the Cape. Barnstable, I think it was Barnstable and or one other town in the Cape that has really good dock regulations. So I was going to look at that. Excellent. And then also just a side note, I have a call at some point next week or the week after with uh, the Dedham Conservation Agent, and they just passed this really awesome, you know, tree regulations for stormwater and or wetlands. So I will Great. be looking at that too. Um, but yeah, it's definitely good to kind of compare and see what other regulations are out there. Um, council gave me a few other recommendations for other towns, but I definitely do want to look at them because I think it is good to always update your regulations on the yeah. most current information. And this letter from D this paper from, you know, 2021, 2022 highlights a lot of those. And um, yeah, it's definitely important to change gears when we see that data change. Yeah. Our, salt, our salt marshes are under assault. Yeah, they there's are. No, there's no mm -hmm. doubt about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there's going to the North and South River Watershed Association has a forum uh, next Wednesday on, on the subject. I've just spent uncounted hours tracing the uh, 1952 uh, boundaries of the salt marsh in the North River and compare it with the uh, 2015 data. Yeah. And there are significant losses in, in 60 years. Mm -hmm. um, yep. there, there are a number of reasons for it. Nitrate is, is implicated in this. Uh, boat wakes, all, all sorts of things are go, kind of going wrong in the salt marsh, and the state has a big push to preserve them. Yet, th it, we also have these these uh, other laws that that are standing in the way of, of preservation and and even remediation, perhaps. So, uh, it, it's an important issue. It's important to me. Mm -hmm. There's uh, also a. I, uh, I would have loved to deny the, the same here. The docks, honestly. But legally, um, I've been trying. Through. I've been trying to deny them for six years without much success. Yeah, we just have to be careful, guys, because if we say that we have like a an act of bias against docs and this project were to, you know, we we can't do that in a public meeting. We can definitely express concerns, and you can say things like, "I won't approve of this project as is." But you can't say, "I'll never sign off on a doc project in a public meeting," because then. It, it can open up a lot of scrutiny to the commission. So part of my training, keeping your commission out of trouble. Um, so yeah, it's definitely okay to obviously voice concerns and to say that you have concerns with the design and the impact and et cetera, but you can't say like, I hate docs and I'll never approve of one. Um, it's just, it's I, I not didn't exactly thing. say that, did I? No, I know, I'm just, I'm just saying it's, it's, it, it is gonna get us in trouble. So I'm just trying to protect yeah. you guys. <laughs> I'm waiting for the handcuffs. By yeah, <laughs> I don't have them. I'm not gonna put them on you. Uh, I, I just I just think if uh, the Division of Marine Fisheries has their set of standards, yeah. if if we we should just take their standards and multiply them by like four, because we <laughs> yeah. want to be more restrictive, <laughs> yeah. and then the docks will basically be so expensive that no one will buy Good one. Good idea. Yeah. You and know, you do like a clear dock or something, you know, like that would allow more light. I, I don't know. Well, like, is I, that I think possible? I think instead of like a, a fiberglass I think one, a, I think instead of a one point five to one, it should be a six to one. Yeah. So it's twenty five feet up in the air, and <laughs> they they don't want column. They want maximum column spacing. So you know, thirty thirty five feet, something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, so. <laughs> Just do a skyscraper. I mean, the, first, the first one will come in at like a million two, and when people will stop building them, it has to be cantilevered the whole way. Exactly. I also am, um, I'm also curious to know how zoning reviews these because most dock projects, actually, I think all dock projects go to zoning because it's about a use thing. And then yeah. sometimes it has to do with variances. So, for example, I won't mention the address, but there is a, a dock project going through zoning right now that hasn't even made its way some conservation and I thought that was weird and I realized it was because obviously a lot of it's a very tight lot a lot of setback issues there's a lot of concerns from neighbors etc um but yeah I would like to really see how zoning looks at these two I mean I don't know how much they really look at them other than just the use but it would be interesting to kind of compare notes and seeing if our boards can be consistent uh you know just in terms of our current bylaws but 
yeah, we, we should definitely be incorporating this at least into our regulations. And it sounds like council even wants stuff more in our bylaws because that has more teeth. So um, something we should probably consider for maybe even a future bylaw update. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we're making progress. We had yeah. two votes against them tonight. We just need Mr. Bell to come on board and then it'll be able to break even and then they're dead. <laughs> they'll, just go, they'll just go to court and beat us. They will, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. If, you, if you're not, that'll make them more expensive, and then we still. That win. is true. That is if true. You're not willing we'll to go lose to jurisdiction. Court, <laughs> if you're not willing to go to court, you're not doing your job. You got to push the envelope. Oh goodness gracious! All yeah, right. there's some articles from this year, last year. Uh, some attempts to put moratoriums on private piers down the Cape, which uh, I'll send to you, Charlotte. They're pretty interesting. interesting. That'd be good. Yes. Are all the lawyers having a field day with that one? They were not successful, but okay. Uh, there was one in Barnstable <laughs> that was lifted last year. Mm. Okay. Well, we well have, I heard that. I heard you really think about how to make them uh, more restrictive and take it right to the edge of of uh, yeah. civil litigation here. If zoning can also, uh, zoning is going through a working, like a bylaw working group, like series of meetings. And so zoning also has the power to potentially limit the use. And that's something that we unfortunately can't argue, you know, from a use perspective, but zoning can. And that's definitely a critical role in all these docs. Like zoning's also letting them happen too, because it's an allowed use as long as you're in compliance with their bylaws. So if they were to tighten theirs, about the use, the setbacks, maybe not giving variances, like that can also be a potential hindrance, even if we can't do that. Um, like I said, the one that's going through right now is facing a lot of variance issues and zoning doesn't have to give it to them. So so in that situation or others like that, who has the power to deny that? I mean, because when you look like a couple of our, our um, cases are also going to, um, See, uh, zoning Board of Appeals, and they have a little checklist of whether or not, you know, they've been to conservation and planning board and special permit. And, and so is it zoning that has the final say? What I, I mean, don't really, it's kind of like a chicken and egg concept, you know? Yeah. Like, who has that power? That's the first thing I wanted to say. And yeah. So looking at the case that you had, were referring to that you didn't name. You know, there's a lot of, I see, I see a lot of um, uh, local comment online about that. And mm -hmm. to my surprise, maybe I've been out of the loop or something, yeah. but quite a bit. And, you know, most are not for it. Um, and I'm, I was thinking, huh, you know, it's kind of interesting. And maybe now's the time to kind of gather that sentiment and and start trying to change the bylaws if you have. Where, yep. Tell me, tell me where did you see those comments? On the one four three website. Oh okay. yeah. Can't name the address yet to Maybe. avoid any potential. Yeah, but once we get the submission, you guys will see it, and you'll see all the better letters. If we get it, I don't know if they'll even go through with it with all this. Well, that's my question. See, who can they can zoning board of appeals? Who's the final? Yeah. In terms of the use, I'm not so sure, but definitely zoning, if they don't grant the variances, that project probably can't go through. I mean, they could definitely appeal zoning's decision. Yeah, and you can, yeah, no, it's it's a good question, Kathy, I don't know. I mean, we definitely have certain abilities to obviously deny permits for our reasons, but zoning sometimes, I don't wanna put the ball in their court, but I feel like zoning a lot of times does have the power because they have a lot of control over the use, the setbacks, where you're putting, the thing if you're even allowed to build the thing at all whereas we don't necessarily have that jurisdiction we can tell you where to put it in regards to our buffer zones but when it comes to other projects we're kind of like oh okay right which gets back to what we were talking about at the last meeting mm -hmm. about you know um the the uh, which board should everybody go to first should they? yeah no it's it's tough the the building inspector uh has a process but unfortunately it's not a bylaw right now he is trying to streamline submissions where you apply for a building permit first, and then he tells you where to go. And it's split up into phase one and phase two. And phase one is zoning, planning, and conservation. And then phase two is obviously board of health, sewer, water, et cetera. But unfortunately, as we've seen, of course, that's not happening with every permit. So at the very least, what we've been trying to do on the town's end is every time I get a submission uh, or vice versa, I send it to everybody. 
And I'm actually supposed to do that per our regulations. So I don't know if that was done previously, but I'm supposed to. I'm supposed to send it around for, for comment from other town departments. So at the very least, planning, zoning, and I, we're all trying to be on the same page with all of our submissions. Um, you know, the only thing that's obviously falling through the cracks is obviously when um, zoning obviously uh, updates our plan from what we approved and vice versa. And those aren't always obviously officially submitted back to us. And applicants think that that's our job when it's definitely not. Um, so we're trying to get tighter with that. But at least with initial notification, usually we all know about the, the projects that are coming around and we're like, OK, what's the status? When are you seeing it? Um, yeah, but. We've definitely been trying to tighten that. However, that's not perfect with every other department. I have no idea what sewer does. I have no idea what water does. Um, you know, so hopefully all departments can eventually act like that. We do try to notify everyone, but I don't get emails, you know, when sewer, water, everybody. Well, Board of Health, I sit right next to the director, but you know, she's different. Big coordination. Eric, Eric, I gotta tell you, you gotta watch out though. You know, depend you gotta pick your fights because I was on a project recently where zoning denied it because the um there were too many al flowers that had uh, allergies associated with them. Oh, is that really? What? City? No. Yes, honest to God. Well, yep. so, was this in Cohasset? No, but okay. <laughs> it's close enough. Okay. It's close Mr. enough. Chairman, Chairman, I have to break for 10 minutes. I have a dog that wants to go outside. There is there, a puppy. We're, we are ready to adjourn. Okay. All in favor? Yeah. Great, uh, great meeting. Uh, Thank you. Uh,